All right, let's pray. Father, as we begin tonight, we want to thank you for all the blessings you've given to us, especially the meal we have shared together. May you bless all those who are sharing tonight, and may you bless all those who are learning tonight about your grace and forgiveness in Jesus. May we truly celebrate the season and all that it means. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, first, I want to draw your attention to the single-page handout I gave you, because as I was working on Judges, it uh, was very frustrating to get to the end of the book and realize that chronologically it's not given in order. So here I finally did some research and found this. So uh, you look at chapter one, which is like the fifth one down or sixth one down, uh, one through 16, go in chronological order of the judges. And there are 12 judges, and I've highlighted the 12 judges for you. But then at the end of the book, the writer to the book of Judges seems to tack on, here's what was going on before the Judges. And that's chapter 17 through 21, because chronologically, it comes before the Judges. Okay. Uh, so the end of the book tells you how bad it was and why they needed Judges. And when we get to the end of the book, it's horrible. It's, it's, it turns your stomach horrible, okay? Uh, and I, I started, I toyed with the idea of starting with chapter 17, and between 17 to 21, and then jumping to chapter 1 uh, to keep it chronological. We're not going to do that. We're going to start with chapter 1. So we get the 12 judges first, and then we get a whole lot of history of what's going on in the life of the people that is chronologically happening before the, judge, the first judge is called. Any questions on that? Okay, it's, it's, I know it's confusing because I got to the end, working on the end, past Samson and Delilah, and get all these stories of what's going on that are events happening before the judges come along. And I had to go research and say, what is going on? And it's because they, the writer that put the book of Judges together kind of stuck this stuff on the end and said, here, you need to know this, but it's not chronologically the same. Yeah, Something. Now, it doesn't seem like Samuel, but maybe maybe it is because we're not given the name of the author. Uh, I don't know who that was. Okay. Uh, and then also, uh, at the end, remind me to talk about what I got laying here before we once turn the camera off. It's Christmas gift stuff. So let's delve into it. So chapter one, this is going to be not quite a verse by verse because it would take like a really long time. So we're going to do kind of sections. It covers all the verses, but it's kind of sections. So we'll kind of go through it together. The book of Judges begins by speaking of the conquest of the promised land. So Moses dies. Joshua leads the people into the land. Okay. Uh, there's no hint of worship of the worship of pagan gods during the life of Joshua. As long as Joshua is leading the people, the people are faithful. But the 12 tribes do not drive out the inhabitants of the land. There's the crux of it, because they were supposed to drive out the inhabitants of the land, and it's to be the land for just the descendants of Abraham, uh, through Jacob, the Israelites. They don't do that. And because they don't do that, these pagan nations come back to, to plague them over and over again. So after the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired of the Lord, who will be the first to fight for us against the Canaanites? Now you're going to, we're going to start at verse 1. We're going to come to a point in the chapter that talks about Joshua still being alive. So that's not exactly chronologically, okay? That's the, that's the challenge. So the Israelites had Moses as their leader for 40 years. Remember, Moses' life was divided up in three sections of 40. 40, year, 40 years as a prince of Egypt, 40 years living in the land of Midian at the base of Mount Sinai with Jethro and his first wife, and then 40 years leading the people. Joshua was chosen to lead the people across the Jordan and take possession of the land. Who were the two spies when, they, when Moses, because I mean they go from Egypt to 
through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. God establishes the covenant. They make a beeline to the promised land. They send in 12 spies. 10 come back and say, the land is too impossible for us to take. Who are the two that said, let's go take it? Joshua, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. They're the only two senior citizens that enter the promised land. You realize that? Yep. Okay? Track with me here. God said as a punishment for the faithlessness of Israel that no one older than 20 years old at the time would enter into the promised land. So in the 40 years of wandering, because it wouldn't enter in, everyone that was older than 20 years old died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. So the oldest someone could possibly be going into the promised land is 60 years old, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Okay? Joshua's chosen to be the leader. Uh, Deuteronomy, and the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. This is the first time the children of Israel have been without a designated leader appointed by God. When Joshua dies, they don't have a designated leader. They know they need God's guidance, so they'll go at the end of the choir. Now, this is that first generation that's still alive when Joshua died. You know, these are the ones that Joshua let in, okay? Judah was a tribe. I said, the Lord answered, Judah is to go. I've handed the land over to him. Judah is the tribe to which the Messiah would come. Judah would be given victory by the hand of the Lord, okay? So Judah, you know, they're inquiring. Who, who goes to fight? God says, Judah, all right? Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a young lion, my son. You return from the kill. He crouches, he lies down and like, a, like a lion or a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff between his feet until he whose right it is comes to comes and the obedience of the people belongs to him. It's a messianic prophecy that the Messiah is going to come through the line of Judah. And he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You've heard that phrase before. Okay? So verse 3, Judah said to his brother Simeon, now Judah is not the individual. It's the tribe of Judah. It says to the tribe of Simeon, come with me to my allotted territory and let's fight against the Canaanites. And I also will go with you to your allotted territory. So Simeon went with him. When Judah attacked, the Lord handed the Canaanites and the Pezzarites over to him. They struck down 10,000 men in Belzec. Okay, so 10,000 people died. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords and spears and clubs and whatever else they can use to kill people. Okay, the land was inhabited by multiple nations, but largely populated by the Canaanites. Who's the vast majority of the descendants of the land of Cana? The vast majority come from Abraham's other son, Ishmael. So you have, you know, blood fighting blood, in a sense, because they're all related. Now, the reason Judah wanted Simeon to help when you go to the division of the land, there's a map that shows that the land of Judah is a pretty big area territory, and the land of Simeon is right in the middle of it. So it made sense. It made sense for Judah and Simeon to fight together to conquer that section of the land together. So they were. It was good strategy, you know, battle strategy, if you will, uh, for them to fight together. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Uh, fought against him and struck down the Canaanites and the Pezzarites. When the Adonai Bezek fled, they pursued him, caught him, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. God has repaid me for what I have done. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. So this is a pagan king, and my point is it's interesting <laughs> that he sees the punishment he receives as a just as justice brought against him for what he did. Now it very well may be because um, you go to another era of history when uh, Balaam, who's a prophet, you remember Balaam's donkey talks to him, mm -hmm. and King Balak wants Balaam to curse the children of Israel, and God won't let him speak a curse, okay? Uh, you know, the Balak knows that if Israel has the blessings of God, 
he doesn't have a chance. The, the people inhabiting the land see this group of Israelites who've crossed the Jordan or are coming across the Jordan, entering into their land. They're an invading army. There's all kinds of estimates. Was it 1 million, 2 million, or up to 6 million people came out of Egypt? They don't know. How many people were there 40 years after they wandered the wilderness? More than came out, probably. So, you know, you're talking about millions of people flooding in to this little tiny nation area of land. How big is the promised land? 160 by 60. Yeah, <laughs> roughly. About 148 miles north and south from Dan to Beersheba and 65 miles or so at its widest point at the, at the Dead Sea. It's a, you know, it's a very small area of land, like here to Abilene, okay? That's the entire north to south distance for the designation. It's a very small area of land. We got millions of people entering into it. It's noticed. So it could be like at another time they realize, this king is realizing that, the, that Israel's God is reaping vengeance upon him and bringing justice upon us. That's what he did. Seventy kings have had their thumbs and big toes cut off. Why thumbs and big toes? Because of provide balance. And it's humbling. And it's humbling. Yeah. Gone. You can't hardly eat. You're kind of scrounging on the ground and you can't walk. Can't pick it up. Can't pick it up and you can't walk. It's a, it's a humiliating thing. And this king was humiliating these other kings. And so he himself is humiliated. Verse 8, the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem, captured it, put it to the sword, and set, and set the city on fire. Afterward, the men of Judah marched down to fight against the Canaanites, who were living in the hill country, the Negev, and the Judean foothills. Okay? Now you see the area there that's designated on the map as the Negev. And you see Beersheba, which in the official designation of the land of Egypt, the land of Israel is from Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba would be the southernmost end of the promised land, but the Negev goes much further. Okay? And I've got some pictures. That's what it looks like. Not much there. Looks like our sand dunes. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but, so the Canaanites are the, the Philistines. We're going to get to the Philistines in a minute. We're going to talk about them, all the people of the land. Canaanites were the largest group. But you've got about eight different nationalities, if you will, living there, eight different tribes. You get the Pezzarites, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Ammonites. You have all these tribes of people living in the land. Now, it's interesting that here they fight against Jerusalem and they burn it, but they don't make that a major city yet. Okay? When does Jerusalem become the capital of Israel? Under King David. David. It's not until David. So you got the judges, then you have Samuel the prophet, and you have Saul as king, and then you have uh, David becomes king, and then Jerusalem becomes the capital. But so it's a while before Jerusalem becomes the capital. Judah also marched against the Canaanites who were living in Hebron. Hebron was formerly named uh, Kiriath Ar Arba, I guess I say it. They struck down Shishai and Hyman. And Talmai, I say these words. So Shishai, one of the sons of Anak, perhaps an old Hebanite clan name. These show back up later. <coughs> and it shows Iman, one of the names given to those of the three children of the of the three, the children of Anak. And Talmai, a clan, possibly the Armenian origin, generally reputed to be of gigantic height. Okay. Uh, resident in Hebron at the time of the Hebrew conquest and driven out by Caleb. Who were the giants? The Philistines. The Philistines. Okay. So you're getting these intermingling. Okay? So you got the Dead Sea. Uh, these were evidently uh, those whom the 12 spies called giants. Goliath would have come from this clan. Uh, over here, Gaza, what's in the news today? The Gaza Strip, where they're fighting. Same region, goes along the coastline here. The Philistines were primarily fishermen. They lived off the ocean. And they were giants, and it's in this region here. There's mountains in here. 
So this is the valley and the, and, the, and the plains leading to the water. Then you have the mountains and then come down over here to the, to the plains again to the Dead Sea. I have a topographical map in a minute that I'll show you. It shows you the mountain regions. But uh, you have these people <clears throat> all through the land, okay? Now, from there they marched against the residents of the beer. The beer was formerly named Kirath Sefer. I always say these names. And Caleb said, whoever attacks and captures Kirath Sefer, I will give my daughter, Asha, to him as a wife. So on Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's youngest brother, captured him. And Caleb gave, gave his daughter, Aksha, to him as wife. Othniel is the first judge. Okay? So... Caleb was a man of great courage who boldly followed God's command and trusted him. If you remember, I did a sermon and, and highlighted Caleb a while back, several months ago, and I made a point that Caleb is one of the oldest men, and when they cross into the Promised Land, he asks and request of Joshua to go and fight against the toughest region, against the mightiest people. He takes the hardest battle as his own. Uh, he has that much faith, that much courage. You know, he trusts in God. Uh, and he's seeking to challenge the men of Judah to do the same. So his nephew, Othniel, becomes the first judge. What's interesting here, uh, well, let's back up to Joshua. Quick. I'm still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now. For war and for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakin was there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out just as the Lord has spoken. So he actually requests the toughest battle. When she arrived, this is Othniel's wife. She persuaded Othniel to ask her father for a field. She got off her donkey. Caleb asked her, what do you want? She answered him, please give me a blessing, since you have given me land, and then again, give me springs also. So Caleb gave her both the upper and lower springs. So what's interesting, and the reason I put, made the note there, is that normally daughters do not receive an inheritance. <coughs> it only goes to the sons. And Caleb gives his daughter land with springs. <coughs> uh, as an inheritance to his daughter. So very unusual action on the part of Caleb. Very good dad. Very good dad. And of course, having the water was, was the key there, okay? Is there a class in seminary that you missed out on on how to pronounce these names? <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just asking, because well, I can't pronounce them either, so. It's, it's, <laughs> they don't teach you that. I could go phonetically do it, but that's the actual fact. Actually, we get an Israeli guy in here. He probably set us straight on something. Like that. <laughs> probably so. More than likely. So, when she arrives, she put. Oh, we're gonna do that. Okay. The descendants of the of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, had gone up with the men of Judah from the city of the palms, city of palms, to the western to the wilderness of Judea, which was in the Negev of Arid, Arid. And they went to live among the people. So Moses' father-in-law, Jethro also known as Ruel, was the priest of Midian and a Kenite. So Moses' descendant, Moses' family by marriage, are with them. Now remember, uh, I uh, have told y'all, when they came out of Egypt, where did Moses get his second wife? From Egypt. Well, not from well, Egypt. But she, well, yeah, she came out of Egypt. She came out She of was Egypt. from Kush. She was from yeah. you know, modern Ethiopia. She was a black woman. Because when Pharaoh let the, the slaves go, all the slaves left. So while all the Israelites came out of Egypt, the other nationalities that were slaves came out with them. And you had these other nationalities traveling the wilderness. Now some of them probably said, hey, I'm going home, and took off. But some of them stayed with Moses and the Israelites. And Moses eventually marries a woman who's not a descendant of Jacob and is a black woman from Ethiopia who's with the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when they come out and they go to Mount Sinai and God does all that God does in Mount Sinai, that Jethro, 
Zipporah, Moses' first wife, Zipporah, her father and other family, had her all. Because they've been worshiping the God of Mount Sinai. And now the God of Mount Sinai has all of his people here. So they stay with them. So you get a reference here that, that Moses' in-law family is also still with the Israelites. Now you also see on there uh, Jericho OT, Jericho NT. That's because Jericho OT, <laughs> Old Testament, is the Jericho that Joshua destroyed. Walls came down. Yeah. The New Testament Jericho, Herod the Great built as a summer residence, basically, uh, as another palace. Uh, and you see where Jerusalem's at. So he would go from Jerusalem to Jericho, had another palace there. It's called the City of Palms because of all the springs and the lush vegetation that's there. And so uh, the, the New Testament Jericho was not built exactly where the Old Testament Jericho was. Now, one of the things that archaeology has discovered is the, and I think I've got it on here, uh, somewhere in here, the tell, in, in the archaeological terms, the tell is the mound where Jericho set, where they've excavated an archaeological stuff. The tell of Jericho, I think, if I remember right, it's about 50 feet high. So it was built way up high on a hill. And Jericho was a very defendable city when Joshua and the Israelites marched around it. What's interesting is if you attack a city and breach the walls, which way do the walls fall? In upon the city. Right? Collapse in upon the city. Archaeology has proven the walls of Jericho fell out. God went poof. And all the walls fell outward. Isn't that so he could, they could go in? It was a lot easier for them to go. Well, it didn't matter. The point was that if, if, a wall, if the army is pressing against the walls and is going to breach the walls, the walls would finally crumble and cave into the city from the opposing army coming against it. I know, but they marched around. And blew the trumpets, and God had the walls And the walls in. came down, which made it a lot easier for them to totally breach. Yes, that's my point. The point oh, is yeah. that, that archaeology has proven that they fell outward, which yeah. is not a normal thing. It's a miraculous thing. It's a God thing that they fell outward. And, and God caused all the whole walls just to fall outward, which makes no sense other than it's a miracle. It right. made perfect sense to God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Judah went with his brother Simon, Simeon, struck the Canaanites who were living in Zephath, and completely destroyed the town. So they named the town Hormon. And you see, um, which one? Hormon's down south. This bottom of the screen. So that's part of the region of Judah. Simeon's helping. Okay. Uh, and these are just, I'm trying to show you in the map what they're doing. They're going around and, and fighting at all these places and, and conquering the land step by step, if you will. Judah captured Gaza and its territory, Ashkelon and its territory, and Ekron and its territory. So you see... Uh, Gaza is here. Ashkelon is here. And I don't think uh, Ekron is on the map. I never did see it. Oh, it's over here. Okay. So, and Goliath was from Gath, remember? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is all the Philistine territory that's marked there. And so, because it was up against the, against the, the ocean or the Mediterranean Sea, they were common you know, for them to make the living off the sea and stuff. And those, that area is where the Philistines continue to live and continue to plague. Uh, they weren't driven out. They weren't driven out. Now there's the topographical map. <clears throat> now it's all in Hebrew because it's the one I can find. Uh, the fuel. You know, you've got Gaza at the very bottom. Ashkelon there, you can see those we're just talking about. But see, this is plains, and then it gets very high mountains, and it goes down the other side. So it's there, it's very rugged, mountainous territory in between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. And we're going to get to, well, this passage here. The Lord is with Judah and enabled them to take possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the people who were living in the plain because those people had iron chariots. Chariots don't work well in the mountains. But in the plains, it's a you know, formidable weapon. 
So they could not drive them out there. Okay, which which side of the mountain? We're talking about the plains down toward the ocean. Okay. That's the that's the area where they weren't able to. They conquered some of the cities, but they couldn't drive them all out. Yeah. There was also some areas where the Lord had told them to fight in a certain direction. He handed them a victory, and one of the reasons was because of uh, the land was kind of somewhat marshy or something, I guess, and the, or spring or something, the rains, so it made it soft, and so they couldn't use their chariots or foot but soldiers. But that, that isn't in the book of Judges, though. That's in another place. Oh, that's another place? Oh, okay. Uh, I in Judges. Judah gave Hebron to Caleb, just as Moses had promised, and Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak who lived there, the three sons that we talked about before. So we're going kind of circular in our thoughts, okay? The writer of Judges is repeating what has been said, but this time with finality. He talked about the three sons of Anak. Now he's talking about Caleb drove them out, okay? When the time of conquest is over, the land promised to Caleb was given to him. When, the, uh, when this was stated before, it was during the time of conquest. So you have the writer repeating and telling us, now this part of it is final. Okay? Now, that was Simeon and Judah. Now we got Benjamin. At the same time, the Benjamite, Benjaminites did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. The Jebusites have lived among the Benjaminites in Jerusalem to this day. So we're back to Jerusalem again. They, they, con they battled, they burned it, but then they didn't settle it, and so these people come in. Now, 1 Samuel 17, And David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and finished him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose up and shouted, and they pursued the Philistines as far as the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the Philistine dead lay along the way to Sha'aram, even the Gath and Ekron. Then the sons of Israel returned from their close pursuit of the Philistines and plundered their camp. And David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his weapons in his tent. I put that in there for a reason. First Chronicles. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, that is Jebus, and the Jebusites, okay, and the Jebusites. Uh, the inhabitants of the land were there. And the inhabitants of Jabez said to David, You shall not enter here. Nevertheless, David took the mountain stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David had said, Whoever is the first to kill a Jebusite shall be chief and commander. Joab, the son of Zeruah, went up first, so he became chief. And David lived in the stronghold, therefore it is called the city of David. But he built the city all around him, from the Milo Emilio to the surrounding area, and Joab repaired the rest of the city, and David became greater and greater, and the Lord of armies was with him. So in 1 Chronicles 11, David finally conquers Jerusalem and takes it and makes it the capital of the Israelite people. That's not to 1 Chronicles 11. Here in 1 Samuel 17, David takes the head of Goliath to Jerusalem. And the Jebusites are there, and he taunts them with it. Okay, now here is the point. Why has Calvary called the place of a skull? Many have, have attempted to envision a skeletal face in the rock formations as the reason for the name. In all likelihood, David buried the head of Goliath on the hill outside Jerusalem as a message to the Jebusites who were living there that he was coming for them. And there is Golgotha, the place of the skull, and you go around, you get all these pictures, and look around, yeah, you see some eyes and kind of a nose, and it kind of looks like a skull skeletal face, so they try to call it the place of the skull because of that. Why would they name it the place of the skull? What if that's where if David, David buried the last buried, head there, there he, took the head there and taunted him yeah. with it, you know, the head of the champion, and buried it up there somewhere, it would be known as the place of the skull to the Jews, for sure. And so, more than likely, it, it was called the place of the skull because David took the last head there. And probably buried it there. Okay? And that's that's the thing. David is what? A shepherd boy. Right? He's a kid when he kills Goliath. He cuts off his head, you know, kills Goliath with a sling. 
no, we're building a rock. Uh, here's the tidbit for you. How, David went down to the river and got how many stones? Six or seven. Five, I believe. Oh, five. Because when he went and fought Goliath, how many did he use? Three. No. One. One shot, one kill. But Goliath had, one, I think, one brother and three sons. If I remember right. I think he had a brother and three sons. Because later they're killed in other battles with the Israelites. And David, went when he went took on Goliath, he said, I'm ready to take on the whole clan. I'm ready to take on Goliath's brother and his children if I have to. He took five stones because there are five of them. He went prepared with confidence that if he had to fight more than one giant, he was ready. He had enough ammo to do it. And he's a shepherd boy. So when he cuts off his head, he takes the head and makes a beeline for the city of Jerusalem. He's fighting the Philistines, but he goes and taunts the Jebusites. Why? Because he already has it in his heart that God is going to use him to take the city of Jerusalem. And it's not until, for, and, you know, after, because you got in 1 Samuel, you got Samuel talking about David killing Goliath. Who's king? Saul's king. And you have all these years that Saul chases David after he grows up. Because he's a boy right now. And after he grows up, David has a 600 men. And Saul chases him all over the place and tries to kill him. Because Saul is jealous of him. Mm -hmm. Remember the taunt? Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. And, and, and Saul is jealous. He wants to kill David. So it's after Saul's death and the death of Jonathan, David becomes king. And then he goes back where he took the lie's head. And takes the city of the Jebusites, Jerusalem, and makes it the capital, makes it his home. There's a lot of history going on that's all tied together in this. Uh, and it all comes here because the Benjamite, Benjaminites did not drive out the Jebusites. Okay, they failed to do that. Okay? Then, the success of the house of Joseph. We're going to talk about tribes in a minute. So I need to watch the time for me because I don't have a clock. The house of Joseph also attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. They sent spies to Bethel. The town was formerly named Luz. The spies saw a man coming out of the town and said to him, Please show us how to get into, into town, and we will show you kindness. Then he showed them the way into the town. They put the town to the sword, but released the man and his entire family. Then the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a town, and named it Luz. That is its name still today. So not unlike uh, Rahab the harlot in Jericho, you know, hidden spies, no. uh, you know, and then the tribes, there were actually 13 tribes of Israel. It was not a tribe of Joseph. Who were Joseph's children? Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim. So if you look on the map, you have West Manasseh, and there is an East Manasseh on the other side over there. It's not showing this map. It'll show another map in a minute. Because part of the tribe of Manasseh told Moses, hey, we like this land. We'll, stay on. we'll come over and help you fight, but we want, to, want this land. Manasseh was a big tribe. Okay? So they divided themselves in half. Ephraim is in the middle there. Those are the two sons of Joseph. Okay? Well, who's missing? Who's not up there? Probably not. Levi. Because they're a priest. They're a priest. They, are, they do not inherit land. They're given cities and pasture land for their animals, but they do not inherit regions of land because God took the tribe of Levi as his priest and said they will live off the offerings of the temple, you know, the God's people. And so they're provided for by the offerings of the people. They do not inherit land. So there's 12 <laughs> tribes of Israel are the 12 that inherit land but there's a tribe of Levi that does inherit land. So you take Levi out of the mix, you take Joseph out of the mix, and put in Joseph's two sons. Okay, so here you go. Sons of Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Benjamin, and Joseph. The tribes, they're the same. Um, well, a little bit of it. Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Benjamin, then Ephraim and Manasseh. You take out Levi, take out Joseph, and add in Ephraim and Manasseh. Those are the 12 tribes that inherit land. 
Okay. Levi's not on that list because they didn't inherit land. Does that make sense? There's no tribe of Levi. Levi was a tribe as a tribe was chosen to be those who served God in the tabernacle and later in the temple. As such, they were provided for by the offerings of the people. Since they did not inherit land, they were not considered one of the twelve tribes. Here you go. Moses and stood at the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered to him. He said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Every man of you put on his sword on his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man and his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourselves today to the Lord for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. It was because of Levi's faithfulness that this particular episode that God selected them and chose them to be his servants. Uh, the Levitical priests, the whole tribe of Levi, shall not have a portion or inheritance in it with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's offering by fire <laughs> and his property. They shall not have an inheritance among their countrymen. The Lord is their inheritance, as he promised them. Now this shall be the priest's portion from the people, from those who offer a sacrifice, either an ox or a sheep. They shall give the priest the shoulder and two cheeks and the stomach. You shall give them the first fruits of your grain, your new wine, and your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep. For the Lord your God has chosen him and his sons from all your tribes to stand and serve in the name of the Lord always. So, you get, uh, what is saying, the shoulder, the two cheeks, and the stomach. I know you better like to eat stomach. Uh, and the grain, and new wine, and oil, and the first shearing of your sheep. I guess that every, you know, the, not every year, because you should, the first time a sheep is shorn, you get, they get that wool. Okay. All right, so that's why Levi doesn't inherit land. Joshua 14, the sons of Joseph were the two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. They did not, and they did not give a portion to the Levites in the land except cities to live in with their pasture lands for their livestock and for their property. And the sons of Israel did exactly as the Lord commanded Moses and divided the land. So the house of Joseph received a double portion of blessing from God. Just as Joseph was the favored son of Jacob, God blessed Joseph and his descendants. And he blessed his descendants. So, where all the sons of Jacob get one portion of the land, Joseph, the favored son of Jacob, gets a double portion of land. Don't ask me why. It's the way God did it. If God wanted to know, he would have told you. Yeah. All right, so back to Judges. At that time, Manasseh failed to take possession of Beth Shean and Tanik. And the surrounding villages, or the residents of Dor, Iblium, and Megiddo, and their surrounding villages. The Canaanites were determined to stay in the land. So Manasseh doesn't purge the people out of the land, and as a result, the Canaanites are going to continue to plague the people. The land of Manasseh, when Israel became stronger, they made the Canaanites serve as forced labor, but never drove them out completely. So you have a big region compared to some of the others from Manasseh. Evidently, uh, and you see right at the very top of the screen where it's cut off, it says Manasseh again, that's the other side of the Jordan. So they got a bunch of land. At the time Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. So the Canaanites had lived among them in Gezer. All right, so Ephraim, when you look at where Gezer is, right at the bottom of their land, right where it connects to Dan, they drive them out. So all the writer of the judges is telling you over and over again is these pagan peoples are still in the land. Okay? Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, or the inhabitants of Nahole, Nahol, 
So the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Okay, so you have Zebulun, which is on the left, the purple. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're hearing all of them say the same thing. Asher fell to drive out the inhabitants. Uh, the residents of Ko, or Sidon, or Alab, or Akzib, or Elaba, or we'll keep reading. Verse 32, the Asherites lived among the Canaanites who were living in the land because they failed to drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh or the residents of Beth Anatak. They lived among the Canaanites who were living in the land, but the residents of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anatak served as their forced labor. So Naphtali. So we're just repeating ourselves. Amorites forced the Danites into the hill country. They didn't allow them to go down into the valley. So uh, the Danites failed, failed totally. Okay? Uh, and they began to suffer the consequences of leaving them in the valley. The Amorites were determined to stay in Harris, Ijalon, Shalab. Shalabin, in the house of Joseph got the upper hand, the Amorites were made to serve as forced labor. The territory of the Amorites extended from the Scorpion's ascent, that is, from Sela upwards. And you see that the red balloon thing at the top, Sela. Uh, don't ask me exactly why they called it the Scorpion's ascent. I don't know the answer to that, but it's there in the text. So all these... You've got, again, the division of the tribes, but all of that is filled with the Canaanite people. Now, why is that important? Because it shows that one, when you don't obey God, you're going to have a thorn in your side because you disobey. Yeah. So there's the map divided up again, pretty much the same. There you can see East Manasseh and West Manasseh, and, the, and the Manasseh in the land. Uh, Gad is on the on the other side of the Jordan. Reuben's on the other side of the Jordan. Those were good lands, and they wanted those lands. Uh, and so that's those maps are not exactly the same because nobody can look back in history and get the exact boundary lines, if you will. We know generally where they're at. So now we start the judges. So all that was introduction, just to, for you to see that they went in to conquer the land, and they didn't do it. God is going to take it. They're paying for it since. Yeah. So you got the 12 judges, and notice the 12 judges are regional. Nobody judges the whole nation. Okay? Samson, you see where he's at over in Philistia? Who's he dealing with? Philistines. Okay? Uh, Gideon up in the middle? Who's Gideon with? The, the, the Midianites. All right, uh, you got these judges, and they each deal with their clan in a regional way. Okay, nobody judges the whole nation. The nation is in chaos. The reason I printed these out like this is so you could actually, well, it's not very big. You can see the at least have a picture of the maps. Uh, that's why this. What I printed out is a lot bigger than normally I would print. I'd usually do an outline form, but there's so many maps to show you this stuff. How are we doing on time? Uh, it's 714. 714. Okay. All right. So now we're to chapter 2. Okay. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacham. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the, that, into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land, of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? Now we're going to take a little hiatus here about the angel of the Lord. Okay. Bacham is possibly Bethel. Okay. Is that possible that it's actually the city of Bethel? Bethel is an extremely important location. Bethel was first mentioned in the Bible in connection with Abram, who built an altar to God there. From there, Abram went toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. 
There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. After visiting Egypt, Abram returned to Bethel and offered a sacrifice to God. Historians think that Bacham is possibly Bethel. Uh, whether they're right or not, I don't know, but they seem pretty sure. And uh, Gilgal, you see where it's at in relation to, to Jericho. Now, the angel of the Lord, this is something that I think is important that we understand. It's the angel of Yahweh. Okay? Melech. It just means messenger. Yahweh is the proper name for God. Okay? So the word Yahweh is the proper name for God. Giving, it should be given in the Old Testament. I may need to proofread my stuff. Uh, the name the Jews fear to speak lest they break the commandment. The messenger of Yahweh is not simply an angel but much more. Now I want to... Uh, the word angel just means messenger. That's all what angel means. Now, I want to just real quick... Bobby... Uh, <coughs> tried to show you this or talk about this in a sermon one time I think see the this is the word Yahweh see the two dots there and the thing looks like a little T those are the vowels the bigger letters are consonants okay the vowels are under the letter okay so so uh, when you take the what looks like two little dots and little T away and you take the word Adonai which means Lord in Hebrew so like Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adam, is what it says in the Hebrew, you know, in, in Psalm 110. Yahweh, typically in your English Bibles, all capital letters, capital L-O-R-D, all caps, Yahweh. The Lord said to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand so I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It's a messianic prophecy. Take away the vowels from Yahweh and insert the vowels from Adonai. You know what it creates? The word Jehovah. The word Jehovah does not appear in the Bible. It is not a biblical word. It's a person. No, it's a made up name. The Jews were so scared of saying the name Yahweh, lest they break the commandment, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, mm -hmm. that when they came to reading in the text, they would say, and said, and they point to the sky, and you knew to insert Yahweh because they wouldn't say it. Then they came up with this idea of exchanging vowel points so they could say Jehovah. So they wouldn't have to say Yahweh. It was a substitute for Yahweh. So all these people that talk about Jehovah is this and Jehovah that doesn't even appear in the Bible. It's Yahweh. Jehovah is a made up name Just because they, they were scared to say the name Yahweh. They feared God so much. That shows you how far they got away from the relationship with God, which is what he wanted. They were living in fear of God. That they would actually mispronounce the name Yahweh on purpose or create a different words, so they wouldn't have to say it. Okay? And it's not even in the New Testament. No, nowhere. The word Jehovah does not exist in the Bible. You go Google it, you'll get Jehovah all kinds of stuff, but it actually is a substitute word for Yahweh. So, like when people say, like, Jehovah Jireh and all these other things, they're not given the name. Doesn't exist. All right. Now, this is the angel of the Lord. We're going to answer that question. You can also discover more on gotquestions.org. The precise identity of the angel of the Lord is not given in the Bible. However, there are many important clues to his identity. There are Old and New Testament references to angels of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord. It seems when the definite article the is used, it is specifying a unique being, separate from the other angels. The angel of the Lord speaks as God, identifies himself with God, and exercises the responsibilities of God. In several of these appearances, those who saw the angel of the Lord feared for their lives because they had seen the Lord. Therefore, it is clear that in at least some instances, the angel of the Lord is a theophany, an appearance of God in physical form. The appearances of the angel of the Lord cease after the incarnation of Christ. 
Angels are mentioned numerous times in the New Testament, but the angel of the Lord is never mentioned in the New Testament after the birth of Christ. There is some confusion regarding Matthew 28 2, where the King James Version says, the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled the stone away from Jesus' tomb. It is important to note that the original Greek has no article in front of angel. It could be the angel or an angel, but the article must be supplied by the translators. Other translations besides the King James Version say it was an angel, which is the better wording. It is possible that appearances of the angel of the Lord were manifestations of Jesus before his incarnation. Jesus declared himself to be existent before Abraham, so it is logical that he would be active and manifest in the world. Whatever the case, whether the angel of the Lord was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ or an appearance of God the Father, it is highly likely that the phrase of the angel of the Lord usually identifies a physical appearance of God. That answers the question, who is the angel of the Lord? On our website, God. Now, uh, stop for a second and talk about that. There are numerous places in the Old Testament where God shows up in a human form. God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That is... He's walking, okay? He doesn't say he was hovering over the ground or he appeared. He's walking. The three angels come, three visitors to Abraham. And uh, two of them go on to Sodom, and they are angels. They strike the men of Sodom blind. Abraham is left standing before who? Yahweh. Yahweh. <laughs> before God, who's come and appeared to him. Uh, and And... Uh, Gideon comes out of the threshing grain in the wine press, the commander of the army of the Lord, okay? Uh, and he bows down before him. An angel never accepts worship in the Bible. The angel of the Lord will. The angel of the Lord. So there's a, there's a handful of times, and there are typically called theophanies, where God shows up in a human form prior to Bethlehem's manger. I've never split hairs whether it's a Christophany or a theophany being the Father. I think it's always a Christophany. Always, the, the theophanies are Jesus coming uh, prior to Bethlehem's manger. That's the way I've always understood it and taught it. But it's interesting that that here in this text, uh, now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum. Okay, uh, from Gilgal. Okay, that's where he's at, and. Uh, and he, and he Who? goes and talks to them about their mm -hmm. failing to drive out the inhabitants. So God's showing up to say it's time to do something different. Okay? So now I say I will drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Volkium, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So it's a place of weeping. They realize they messed up. Didn't that say the angel of the Lord accepts worship? Mm -hmm. The angel of the, the Lord. Angel. The angel of the Lord. An angel, a regular angel, when he comes, they don't. They, don't. they yeah. refuse to. But the angel of the Lord will. And it's in the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and like, uh, uh, Samson's, Elkanah, his father, and his mother, the, the angel of the Lord appears to her out in the field. She goes and tells her husband, he prays God, no, please send back the guy that came to talk to my wife, but I need to confirm what he said. So she's out in the field again, he comes again. And she says, please stay here, let me go get my husband. She runs to get her husband, brings him back, and they prepare a sacrifice, and he steps into the smoke fire and ascends with the smoke and they fall down and worship and say we're going to die because we've seen God. <laughs> okay? I mean, they're terrified. Exodus. I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the uh, Mediterranean Sea and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River where I will place the inhabitants of the land under your control 
and you will drive them out ahead of you. You must not make a covenant with, their, with them or their gods. They must not remain in your land or else they will make you sin against me. If you serve their gods, it will be a snare for you. So they were to drive them out. Numbers. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of, the, of Cana, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from, you, land from you, and destroy all their idolatrous sculptures, destroy all their cast metal images, and eliminate all their high places. And you shall take possession of the land and live in it. For I have given the land to you to possess it. Okay, now all of this, when he's, he's talking about that from Numbers and in Exodus, uh, in Exodus, it is all referring to after they have crossed into when they go China into the land, and this they is, refuse to drive everyone out. They did, they just stopped. They didn't. They didn't drive them out. God told them over and over again, drive them out. There'd be nobody in the land but but the children of Israel, and they left them in the land. They wouldn't drive them out. They either couldn't at some places because they were trying to, they didn't do it God's way, or they refused to. Hey, you know, it's these can be these people who are slaves. We'll keep them here. Okay. And that's not what they were told to do. Right. They're told to annihilate them, wipe yeah. them out. <clears throat> when Joshua dismissed Pretty the people, harsh. the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. Now that's chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. All through this, the first chapter, we've not heard about Joshua. So it's chronologically, we're kind of flip-flopping. He's telling us that that the people were faithful during that first generation. And all, the genera and all that generation were also gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So what's the problem? Huh. The faith had not been well, used. The God were forgotten. Yeah. And, the and they did not, not obey. So the faith was probably not, according to that, they didn't pass it down like they should have. Explaining, you need to keep this because of this. You know, keep the commandments. Here's what God told us to do: to drive the people out of the land. By this time, the people, the land should have should have been driven out. Okay, they're still trying to drive them out today. Yeah. So they did not. Now I'm going to. Do we see this today? What is the effect? Well, yeah, we see it today. Okay. Because our faith is not being handed down to the next generation. Well, Christianity is kind of. Strange. I'm shutting the door for a second because I want to tell you something. Kind of the, kid, the kids we have here in the church right now, the teenagers upstairs, they do not know the Christmas story. They do not know it's Jesus' birthday. They're being taught that tonight. They do not know what Easter is. When they were asked what Easter was, that's when Jesus died. They didn't know that Jesus rose from the dead. In the discussions last week, they didn't know Jesus rose from the dead. They are ignorant, in the proper sense of the word, of all biblical knowledge. So as you're interacting with these kids, help them understand. Because that's our challenge, because the faith has not been handed down. We have young people in our midst who know nothing of the Bible. The basic foundational things, they don't know. They don't know. Right. The thing is, Christianity and Judaism have a parallel similarities in the fact that uh, we found in the areas that they did just as well. Just as well. All right, so right here where it says the people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the balls. We're going to stop here because now we get into pagan worship. And we're going to start talking about the pagan worship. And I've got some pictures of the pagan gods, their idols that have been found from that era. Okay, these are their statues and stuff. So we're going to, uh, we're going to stop here. Now I'm going to turn the camera off for a second. I need to talk to you all. We've got about two minutes left. <laughs>